This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Simon Phipps joins me today when we talk about OSI, Stewards of the Open Source Definition. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 582, recorded Wednesday, June 10th, 2020, OSI. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Now that a lot of you are working from home, it's even more important to choose a VPN you trust. Get three extra months free with a one-year package by going to expressvpn.com slash floss. And by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash loss. The Floss Weekly, everybody. I'm Doc Searles, and, uh, and my uh, co-host this week is Simon Phipps a.k.a. at WebMink and other things called WebMink. Um, are you there, Simon? I'm there here he somewhere, is. yes, Doc. He is, I'm yeah, here you're in, uh, far over South the Hampton. sea, over in England. You're in the, you're in the, not quite the other side of the world, but but partway there. Um, so um, so this is, we're, we're here to talk uh, today with Joshua from... Um, Open source initiative, and are you? I, you obviously you're very you're more than familiar with this, which is why I wanted to make sure you're co-hosting this one. So, to, so <laughs> well, it's briefly, complicated, briefly. you know, because uh, I I've been on I've been involved with OSI since 2008, um, and uh, in that time I've been an observer, and then on the board of directors, and then the president, and then I've been the secretary of the board, and I left the board in March and joined the staff part time as their director of standards and policy, and so yeah, I've got a passing familiarity with OSI. I, I may have even met you through OSI things. I don't know. We were at so many conferences and other things together. Um, uh, you see, you see that, I, I can't remember that far back, Doc. Uh, <laughs> I've erased those. I've, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I needed to reuse those discs. They were so yeah, I've got those memories, but they're on tape backup, and it has to be get, the tape <laughs> right. has to get mounted right. in the data center. Yeah. So, so we'll 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 bring uh, uh, Josh Simmons in in, a, in uh, shortly. But in the meantime, uh, a, a few words about. Uh, our sponsor, uh, ExpressVPN. Um, I, I have to say, I am not on it yet, but I am getting on it. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm not yet, I had to extricate myself from from my relationship with a competitor, which uh, will not was not as good. <laughs> I can tell you that much. I won't say who they are. Um, uh, hopefully by next week I'll, I'll have that set up. So uh, this this episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. You've heard us all talk about how important it is to have a VPN. And now that a lot of you are working from home, it's even more important to ch choose one you can trust. Um, you know, uh, I, I've liked to do research on my sponsors and, and I only recommend brands I, listeners to listeners that, uh, and viewers, um, that I believe in. And, uh, and I can say with great confidence that ExpressVPN is the best. And also we've, everybody else here has done the same research and that's why they're here. So why is that? Well, for one thing, ExpressVPN does not log your data. Lots of really cheaper free VPNs make money by selling your data to ad companies. Um, ExpressVPN has developed a technology called Trusted Server that makes it possible for their servers to log, uh, to, to log, any, uh, log any of your info. That for speed, um, Many slow your connection down or make your device sluggish. Um, you know, with ExpressVPN, your internet speeds are always blazingly fast. Even when you connect to servers thousands of miles away, you can still stream HD quality videos um, and participate in chats and other things with zero lag. Uh, something else that really sets ExpressVPN apart 
from other VPNs is how easy it is to use. Unlike other VPNs, you don't have to input or program anything. You just fire it up, click on the app, click one button to connect. It's so easy, even your grandparents could use it. And it's not just me saying this. Wired, CNET, uh, The Verge, uh, many other tech journals rate ExpressVPN number one, the number one VPN in the world. So protect yourself with the VPN that we use and trust. Go to expressvpn.com slash floss today and get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free on a one-year package. So that's expressvpn.com slash floss, expressvpn.com slash floss to learn more. So now comes the show. So um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Joshua Simmons. Uh, Joshua, it says here, and it's a lot, uh, a short stack developer, armchair philosopher, dedicated advocate of open culture, got his start uh, in open source thanks to Drupal and the LAMP stack, um, been a freelancer and startup CEO, has worked as a volunteer and professional community organizer, currently serves as president of the Open Source Initiative, and that's why he's here. He actually reached out to me, and I said, wow. And not only that, he's in Petaluma, which is our headquarters. Um, you know, and, uh, and he's a small town cat dad and happy husband, uh, a queer man, outdoorsman and concert goer and aspiring aviator. That's really interesting. I am too. I have never, I've only been a passenger. I've hold, held a stick a few times. So daydreams about being a park ranger. So, so welcome, Josh. And uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's I've, funny because uh, I'm also seeing you for the first time. So that's, that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. I've uh, I've long been a fan of of uh, Twit, and uh, it's you know living in the same town. It's uh, been a goal to to participate one of these days. So uh, here we are. And, and I'm just saying, your 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 uh, senior open source strategy at sale, uh, a guy at Salesforce. Right. I, I held I held a, a, a position kind of like that with BT in the UK for a while as a consultant. <laughs> Uh, to almost no effect, I might add, uh, though they did buy. T- <laughs> you know, um, so it's I don't not know always easy. That's for sure. Ready to talk about that stuff, and of course, the Simon Hill is similar, has had similar roles in a number of places. Yeah, it's, I've done that in a couple of places too. Yes, it's it's uh, not I would, the. I'd like to say to no effect, but you know, it's it's been well, I had, it, I it is challenging. Effect. I had some effect. I had some effect. So, um, they ended up buying a wiki. They bought Tiddly Wiki. Yeah, which is basically to say they they just basically funded. Um, uh, oh God, I just his name just jumped out of my head. Uh, ah, anyway, doesn't matter. Yeah, that guy. Tall, who does Tiddly that guy? Tall, good guy. <laughs> uh, actually, I want to have him on as a guest. I've already sent an invitation to him, as a matter of fact, yeah. at his old address. So I I don't know whether uh, that that got through or not. So tell us, what are both of you about OSI and where it stands now? Because my Acquaintance with OSI is from the early, early days when it was um, Eric Raymond and Russ and Denise and uh, um, uh, what's his name, Tiemann, Michael Tiemann, um, uh, all at a drinking beer and and talking about licenses. And and I've always associated it with licenses alone uh, yeah. because it's the canonical go-to source for what what the approved licenses are and very handy to business uh, uh, or anybody who's trying to start some, you know, uh, license their code in some useful way. So, but it's, it's gone a long way since then. So fill me in. Yeah. So, gosh, 20, 21, 22 years or so uh, since the founding of the organization, OSI, this whole time has carried on its mission of doing sort of the, what I refer to as the the legal janitorial work of vetting licenses, uh, determining whether they're they're open source uh, definition conformant or not, and then approving them or not. And uh, that core mission, that that vetting of licenses, is the really the cornerstone that allows. Uh, companies, nonprofits, uh, government agencies to adopt open source readily um, with with minimal <laughs> minimal chaos and confusion. Um, but OSI has done a, expanded its portfolio quite a lot since then. Um, you know, now OSI runs uh, some educational programs, 
including floss desktops for kids. Um, we have uh, open source technology management programs that we're running with Brandeis uh, to help educate you know, a new wave of professionals about open source. Uh, so OSI has expanded its remit over time, but the cornerstone is still that licensing. Um, and today we have one, two, two staff at like 1.25 full-time equivalent and gosh, maybe about a dozen contractors to help us carry out our mission. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've come a long way, but in recent years, we can tell we still have a lot of work to do. And, and as a, it's a, it's a nonprofit, is it a, a 501c3 or what, what kind of, what breed That's right. of? It, it is a, a, a 501c3 charitable nonprofit. That's cool. That's cool. So, um, so, so Simon, what, um, when you're looking at the Delta of where you, you were probably there longer than anybody continuously, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think I've done it. Know. I've done, um, 11 years in a role at OSI, which I think makes me the longest serving. I think Michael Tiemann might have been there for 11 years as well before he parted ways. Uh, but it, there's mm. been a, there's been really a, a, a significant shift in OSI, um, since I first saw it in 2008, 2009, uh, where I think back in those days, the full workforce of OSI was the board of directors. And it became obvious to us in maybe 2009, 2010, that that, that wasn't going to survive, that uh, if we were going to carry on doing this, what Josh describes as janitorial work on licenses, uh, that the people who did that needed to be able to uh, reside in an organization that had longevity and that uh, licensing alone wasn't enough to help you recruit new people in to do that because, honestly, licensing isn't very interesting. Uh, that's not to say there aren't people who can have big fights about it, but uh, it isn't really very interesting. Uh, and, and what really makes a difference uh, for OSI, it, it, it actually isn't the licenses so much as uh, developers having the confidence that the license that's on the software is sufficient for them to get on with whatever they want to do with, that, do, do with it without having to ask anybody else's permission or go do any negotiations. And so OSI has got to be uh, have a stable group of people who make uh, unsurprising decisions about the bona fides of licenses. And we realized that that function couldn't survive on its own anymore. It needed to be sat inside an organization that did other useful things. And so since about 2012, we've been gradually switching OSI over to a model that is, first of all, um, uh, democratic, it's stakeholder-led. Secondly, that has functions other than licensing. Um, so at the moment, it's doing uh, standards and policy work. It's doing uh, PCs for kids. Uh, that's recycled uh, hardware running free and open source software. Uh, it's doing license approval. Uh, it's doing a, uh, a graduate curriculum in open source management. And all of those things provide a context and then all of those things are in the hands of staff or contractors who keep them rolling, even though the cast of actors on the board of directors is changing. So where we are today, the, the organization Josh is running is really quite different from the organization I joined in 2009. Uh, it has a, a staff. It has functions other than uh, licensing, which are uh, very effective, successful, and global. Uh, it has a much more global reach. It's much more aware of the need for being inclusive and for uh, also being international. And so I'd say it's a completely different organization to what, to the one that I picked up. Yeah, so, so um, Josh, you must have ambitions for it. And um, <laughs> so so let us know what those are. I mean, it, 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 looking out one year, two years, five years, what, or, or just conceptually how, how to – how does this thing grow? Do you want it to grow? I mean, a lot of things you don't want necessarily to grow. Um, right. A lot of nonprofits are stay small to begin with or a certain size. But, but yeah. where, where's it going? Where are you going to take it? So I don't I don't have um, a, a hugely expansive vision for OSI. Um, my my hope is really that we can 
grow the staff of the organization so that it no longer relies on volunteer labor. And because we are we are staff, but we still do rely on volunteers for uh, some of our relatively core operations. And we know we need to get away from that uh, for the, the mission to really be sustainable. Um, so we, we want to add a few more staff. Uh, we want to do uh, a little more fundraising in order to support that. Uh, but we're not talking about becoming a massive organization because there's really not a need for that. Uh, now, that said, there, there are questions and discussions in open source that OSI has not been a part of that we would like it to be a part of going forward. Um, you know, in the last few years, we've had Heartbleed, um, which uh, and, and a number of other severe vulnerabilities that revealed the um, some of the gaps and vulnerabilities in the open source infrastructure that that we all rely on. And so part of that has been the discovery that, you know, some maintainers just aren't well supported. And what can we do to support them better? Um, you know, in recent years, we've also had uh, renewed, um, we've had people rediscovering source available licensing and the open core business model. And we've got VCs who are trying to redefine open source. And we've got activists who are trying to redefine open source as well for completely different reasons. And in the middle of all this churn is OSI trying to hold down the fort with licensing and standards and, and some of its core programs. But we know that OSI needs to be a more capable organization so that it can weigh in on these conversations that are happening around us and be a part of shaping them and bringing them forward. Um, because to date, we've we've not been a leader in those conversations. And uh, and we've gotten feedback from the community that they, they want us to be. That's interesting. So you're, you're expected to be out there more uh, more in a spokesman role from time to time or, you know, the uh, if something blows up. Um, uh, there's some definitional argument about open sources. I'm just trying to imagine what one might be. Not necessarily a giant vulnerability like Heartbleed, but but a, a some some bad thing happens in the world. Open source is implicated. They need, you know, the Wall Street Journal needs somebody to talk about it or whatever. And you're the guy. Is that That's is the hope. you imagine? That's the hope. That's good. That's good. And uh, um, so, so, um, so, so when you mentioned like maintainers, so you have your own maintainers there, or are you talking about ma maintainers of various open source code bases that could use more support, or, or what? Yeah, the, just the, sort the, of the latter. Ended up. We we don't really have yeah. um, uh, we don't really have any maintainers within OSI. I mean, there are yeah. projects that we are home to. Um, but broadly, I'm, I'm referring to the, the plight of maintainers everywhere, uh, particularly maintainers who don't have the benefit of a, a full-time job that is paying them to, to do that, that project maintenance. That, that, that's interesting because in, in the early days of open source, you might say, there, there was this um, – it really happened with, mostly with IBM. I remember talking to a bunch of IBM people about this way back when. Dan Fry in particular who ran an IBM division – and who told me that it took him six years or it took IBM six years before they realized they could not tell the maintainers that they they <laughs> that were working for them of the Linux code what yeah. to do. That in fact, it was the other way around that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had, you know, they had some person that was really employed to do A, but what they're really doing was L. And, you know, they were they maintained file system or they maintained mm -hmm. some module or, and and. Um, uh, but IBM got wise about that and, and so did Oracle and so did, so, you know, some other big companies that Red Hat, of course, was on top of it pretty early on. Um, and, um, but I imagine given the plethora of open source code bases in the world now, millions of them, um, there's a class of actors that are maintainers that are not necessarily employed by companies that are enlightened about what they ought to, uh, about their, what those people are really doing. Uh, Absolutely. Have you, yeah, have you studied what, is there, is there a way you could broadly characterize those and say they're like this and, and we need, we need to make a cause out of getting these people some support? Yeah. So, you know, we have a lot of people who, um, are either freelancers or, um, or, or, or do have a full-time, you know, uh, 
who do have full time employment but don't necessarily have uh, their their managers or supervisors support to spend their time working on open source. And so they end up working on the maintaining their projects at the margins of their day, which realistically is not sustainable. Uh, you know, if, if I can for a moment wear the hat of of somebody who works in corporate open source, um, you know, if my company depends on open source software as basically all of them do, then I have an existential relationship with those projects. And it is in my interest as a, as a business to make sure that the project is well supported, well funded, uh, that the, the maintainers have all the time and resources they need in order to uh, triage issues, uh, take vulnerability reports, uh, put out new releases on a regular cadence. Um, you know, these are things that, that for open source to be, uh, uh, you know, something that we continue to, to encourage people to adopt, not only does the, the licensing need to be predictable, which is what OSI does, uh, but the, the projects need to be reliable. <clears throat> and that comes down to resourcing so often. So uh, one of the things I'm imagining, and it may be something you already have, uh, is, is a way to explain to the world here is how open source gets to the world. You know, th this is what a maintainer does. Here's what, uh, here's how debugging works. Here's how new code gets contributed. Uh, here's how it gets vetted. Um, here's how it gets discussed along the way. A lot of people are familiar with GitHub and and oh, and how that works and versioning and the rest of that. But I, but those are that's inside baseball still. That's still you know you yeah. have to be. You have to be you have to be a, be a programmer to understand what GitHub's about and markup and all that stuff, and but for I'm, I'm especially thinking right now about corporate open source and I'll give you mm -hmm. one example that came up for me yesterday, which is a company that is doing a closed source something. Um, it's not a big code base; it's a rather simple and small code base. They have not open sourced it. They have no intention of open sourcing it until they die, and they <laughs> said, "Well, if we die." then we'll release the code. And what I've noticed in the past is that probably the main reason, and you could correct me on this, or either one of you could correct me on this, that the main reason a company doesn't open source, they're, they're embarrassed by it. They, they, mm. they, they don't want you to see how they made this particular sausage. Or if you actually looked at it, uh, it'd be really spaghetti-ish. And, and I mean, this is the case, for example, I think Jamie Zawinski told me this about the early... Um, Netscape code that became, you know, when they open source Netscape, basically they just ended up doing it all over again when it became Mozilla, uh, oh. because what they had was a little too inside. And and I'm what, but I'm thinking of 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 giving some guidance to companies like why it would be better for you guys to just open this thing in the first first place. And part of that's yeah. a business case, but part of it is also something else. Yeah, you know, I I, ex I encounter. Um, Resistance. Well, let me back up and say when I first started contributing to open source, uh, the reason that I was reticent was that I was I was terrified that my code would be judged. Um, that was that was uh, fraught with fear for me as an individual, and I know that is certainly um, a barrier to to some. Um, the the objection that I encounter more often is that people don't necessarily understand where the the line is uh, above which is the the reason that a customer pays a company money right so say you've got you've got your code base 80 percent of it is probably open source software that 20 percent that layer that you add to the top to glue it all together you know that's that's what people pay you for um, but honestly even of that custom code Probably only five or ten percent of it is the the secret sauce that really makes the company money. In most cases, I would I would argue that a company could open source damn near their entire code base uh, and yeah. still be in business because you know the the magic isn't just in the code; it's in the operations of the code. And once you're at scale, well, that's that's hard for anybody to catch up. Yeah, I mean, one of the examples. I mean, one of the ways that I used to talk about it back when Linux Journal existed and uh, would hold forth in this stuff is, it, it's like, okay, you're building a house or you're building a building. 
there are actually no secrets or very few secrets, if any, about how to do this. Right. You know, you're using two by fours, using two by sixes, you're using these kind of nails, you're using these kind of tools. There's no mystery to it at all. But what's different is the competence about the builder, you know, and right. and you go to this builder because they're better at doing at building the thing that you want than 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 somebody else is. Um, but there's something about code that people, some people anyway, think needs to be secret in the first place. It's our right. intellectual property and all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, and it's and so and but it's also too easy in some cases to just we're going to develop something that uh, that. You know, using off the shelf, whatever, and 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 the shelves are getting bigger now. But probably, you know, Kubernetes is probably the most. The containers yeah. in general are are probably the biggest part of the Linux conversation, or what's what it, where it is now, um, and cloud, you know, and those kind of things. So an awful lot of it is back ended and and containerized right. in such a way that you're just you're you're doing Legos. Um, but it's still the sense that what we're, what we're doing it has to because we're doing it, it has to be secret. <laughs> and there, right. you know, so the so the secret, so so the the challenge is still trying to get across. Uh, I, I, it's it, it saddens me to say stuff that was clear to some of us twenty one years ago, right? <clears throat> it's yeah, it's a hell of a lot easier to build something <laughs> if you know what you're building with. Well, you know, I think we've 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 seen uh, what I will charitably describe as copyright propaganda uh, for for decades. Uh, you know, there are strong trade associations that have been advocating for for proprietary everything. Uh, whether that be software or music or textbooks or data, you name it. Um, so there's there's a huge apparatus uh, out there that uh, advocates for proprietary. And so, you know, th though this is not a new conversation, right? We've we've been having this conversation for 21, 22 years, um, but the the fear, uncertainty, and doubt is strong, and you know I think that's a hangover we'll be getting over for for a long time. Yeah, uh, and even more than that, um, you know, proprietary licensing is viral licensing. Mm. Uh, you, you know, one, once you let a proprietary license into your code base, getting it out again and stopping it from spreading its effects to all the rest of your code is really tough. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, while I was at Sun, I was involved in. Uh, open sourcing our whole software portfolio. And the big challenge there was going back through the history of all the software and going and negotiating new licenses for all the stuff that we wanted to open up. Uh, and once you've allowed stuff in that's under proprietary licenses that can only be changed if you go and negotiate with the, with the copyright holder, uh, the viral effect spreads and spreads and spreads. And, um, you know, that viral effect is completely different to the permissive nature of all open source licenses, be they copyleft or be they uh, non-reciprocal. Uh, open source licenses let you do whatever you want without having to negotiate with anybody, uh, whereas proprietary licenses, are, they're viral and they're sticky and mm. getting them out of your system is really expensive. So I think one of the reasons people don't open source things is because of that, because actually it's it's really expensive to open source something that's got nasty, sticky, viral proprietary licenses in it, and you have to justify the expense to somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it you know it, it it isn't just free to open source something. You've actually got to go and unpick all the all the damage the proprietary licensing did. You know that um, uh, just a quick thought about this. Then we'd um, uh, like to get your thoughts on it before we go to the end. Um, I, I love this metaphor that it's that it's a virus, and I think it's a really good sell. But it was it seems to me what you're dealing with. Okay, you've got a company, and what open source does is it's organic. Okay, it's it's real. It's it's it it's from nature. It's from human nature where. You bring in some proprietary code, you're suddenly dependent on something that's almost prosthetic, right? It's mm. it's kind of like the way Anakin became Darth, right? It's like just add these parts that aren't really yours. And somebody else made them, you know, and and you're dependent on the vendor of that and of and and it's not really yours. And it's and it's weird. I think it's hard for companies to get their head around because they 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 want that throat to choke and and that kind of thing. A terrible metaphor right now, but I mean, but that. <laughs> But that's an old one. You know, I want one throat to choke because I'm I'm, de I'm, I'm dependent entirely on vendors. Uh, but I'm sure in a lot of cases somebody could pull out 
um, Red Hat and put in something else, you know, uh, they're dependent on Red Hat as a company, but they're dependent on their services more than the code itself that's underneath. Right. I think that that speaks to the the style of procurement that companies are, are most used to. Uh, they're used to paying a license fee and then having uh, an account manager or a consultant or somebody who they can hold accountable for when things go wrong. Um, and there's something, you know, intuitive about that, that, that gives companies a lot of comfort. Um, and I think that's one reason that Red Hat was so successful was that not only did they, uh, you know, provide open source software, but they also provided that, that familiar relationship, um, that companies look for, you know, to have, have some sort of representative that they can hold accountable for this, this isn't working, help us fix it. Um, and so it does require people to be a little more imaginative um, in the way they engage with the, their supply chain. Um, but it's it's just a different kind of expense, right? Either you are in a revenue sharing agreement with this proprietary software company for the rest of your company's existence, or you have open source software. And yes, there's an expense associated with helping to support that project community on an ongoing basis. Um, but you, you have to just approach it very differently. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, is, is a, a struggle for people who've come up, uh, in a certain, certain culture and environment that said, this is where I think, you know, the, the graduate program that OSI is running with Brandeis university is really important in efforts like that, where we're really teaching people, how do you manage, uh, open source software as, as a consumer, um, because this is, turns out, kind of novel to some people. I, it, it is. The, I, I would like to actually dig a little deeper into that, and uh, and I know Simon has something really cool to, to say as well. But in the meantime, we have to pay for this thing, and we've got a great way of doing it with a uh, uh, our second sponsor, which is Barracuda. Um, so. This episode is also brought to you by Barracuda, provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security solutions that protect email, networks, data, and applications. Suddenly, you have dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails every day, making them vulnerable. 91% of all cyber attacks start in an email. Spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. You know, multiply that by how many employees you've got times how many emails each one of those get. You know, one click the wrong email costs you money, customers, and reputation. Barracuda's researchers have been a steady have seen a steady increase in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January, and they have observed a recent spike of 667 percent of this kind of attack since the end of February. So get the protection you need for your company with Barracuda Total Email Protection. It includes all-in-one email security backup and archiving, AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise, an annotated incident response that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address attacks, security awareness training to educate your workforce so your employees can be the first line of defense against attacks. So right now there are new attacks impersonating organizations like the World Health Organization. Attackers utilize domain spoofing, misinformation relating to the coronavirus in an attempt to trick users into a phishing scam. So for all these reasons, ensure the safety and security of your business with Barracuda. To uncover threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free threat scan of your Office 365 account risk-free at barracuda.com slash floss. That's barracuda.com slash floss. Barracuda, your journey secured. Okay, so um, so you're mentioning Brandeis and, and the work you're doing with Brandeis, and it suddenly occurred to me, I don't, I have had affiliations with so far, four universities that never would have let me in. Me in, but I once I got old, I was respectable enough to start doing things there. And and even though the, that work has been entirely not about open source, I 
it seems to me open source needs to be taught. Now, is it taught in comp sci or anything like that? Is it is it a part of the the tech curriculum at at universities or or not? I have no idea, actually. It's really it's really not, um, which yeah. which is a huge problem because open source is you know for 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 professional developers, open source is the water we we swim in. Uh, so the fact that it's not in most CS programs is is really a, a, a huge problem. Um, there are a few universities like Brandeis, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, you, know, you can pick some top tier universities. There's probably some open source in there somewhere, uh, but on the whole, it's not in there. And part of the challenge is that the the faculty who are tasked with with creating the, the curriculum and, and educating their students, uh, there's there's some uh, misalignment of incentives um, and a lack of materials uh, for them. And so, you know, on the one hand, OSI is is partnering with Brandeis uh, and the curriculum that's developed there is, is Creative Commons licensed, so it's you know, openly licensed and can be reused. Uh, but there are also other efforts, um, for instance, if you look at the group uh, Teaching Open Source, uh, that is a, a community of, of instructors uh, who get together on a regular basis to talk about how ca they can work open source into their curriculum, uh, how they can increase adoption at their university. Because for somebody to spend four years in university getting a, a CS degree, if they've not had experience contributing to an open source project or not been taught uh, some of the the basics of licensing, um, but they've really done that person a, a disservice, and those are things someone's going to have to learn really quickly once they finally get hired. So, um, Simon, in the in the in the in our in a little back chat here, um, I, I I don't know. You want to come in with this, Simon, because it's too good a one liner. I, I love it actually. Yeah, yeah but I, I'll have to build it, of course. Doc, um, it, you know, yeah. so earlier in the discussion, you were talking about how, oh, exactly, Josh was saying how uh, everyone expects to to go buy a license to their software. I, I don't think that's the way it was originally. I think we mm. we lived in a world where um, the majority of the software that you needed to use, you either made or you were you got from other people who'd already made it. And uh, I, I don't think that that world where you expected to pay for the software. Uh, really came along until later, and it, it was the consequence of uh, this 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 viral idea of uh, proprietary licensing and um, using software as a vehicle for monetizing what was called intellectual property, or, or uh, uh, there are other words for it that uh, people use as well. And, and it was it was kind of like the way that uh, coronavirus has been so infectious. It's it started getting on people's hands and into people's computers and spreading everywhere. And and I wonder whether we should be calling um, proprietary licenses corona licenses because of that. Um, you know. <laughs> I, I, what do you think, Josh? Do you think that, that would, you your, think that would catch it, on? We, well, we stopped talking about look, proprietary licenses. A and we, it's a crown. And, and you, want, you want a crown... This one vendor, right? You know that that, that has a royal level of de, of enforced dependency. Well, the other uh, thing I, I like about it is is that it it picks up that epithet viral. You know the the uh, the, the the corporate world has tried to smear the GNU General Public License with the, with the, the the idea of viral for many years. Uh, it's a completely misplaced yeah. term because you're, nobody forces you to use uh, uh, GPL licensed software. Nobody forces you to um, to uh, add to it with your own code and to uh, to release it to to other people. It's it's something that you do as a as a as a reciprocal gesture to the freedom that was granted to you. And I'd like to turn around that viral word and instead make people realize that it's proprietary licensing that's viral. So so I think we need to start a campaign for calling proprietary licensing um, corona licensing now. I, I think you've got the, the, the makings of a uh, very effective uh, uh, reverse FUD campaign right there. <laughs> that's perfect. It is, yeah. I you mean, know, reverse FUD is, FUD is helpful, you know, and, and, and there is FUD to be had. I mean, well, there's the, something to The other to be thing, Doc, there. which is worth pointing yeah. out here, is that uh, you know a, a significant change from OSI when I joined it 
is that uh, ISI today is actually on, on good social terms with the Free Software Foundation and the Free Software Foundation Europe. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people who will be quite surprised to discover that. But it, it turns out that um, there is much more that unites us than anything that you could find to divide us. Uh, and although that, uh, that slur of calling the GPL viral was used for a long time as a divisive tool in our uh, free and open source software community. Today, uh, we compare notes and uh, we we collaborate where it's reasonable to do so. And we share the burden of work. So one of the things I do in Europe is I, I work with the FSFE's public policy group and we, we, we share the work of responding to the huge tidal wave of uh, public policy initiatives that could harm open source. And so Josh, as president of OSI, has has inherited this mantle of being a, a peer with the uh, the leaders of FSF, of uh, Software Freedom Conservancy, of the Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, fortunately, he seems to actually like those people as well. I think you do, don't you, Josh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, uh, okay. you know, I, I yeah, think... Go for it. One thing that's so important for us to to keep in mind is that these these organizations, uh, you know, Open Source Initiative, Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, you know, all, all of these foundations are are nonprofits, um, and while some are a little larger than others, none of us are are uh, huge or massively resourced, and so we have uh, sort of this alliance of of nonprofits that are taking on a pretty significant mantle uh, because suffice it to say the the interests that that um, you know promote proprietary software are very well moneyed um, and now that said there's a lot of money in open source now as well and so there's there's a little more tension there a little more pushback but on the whole you know we OSI um, needs to have a, a a good functioning working relationship with these other foundations because there's no way that any one of us could could do this alone, not with the way that we're resourced. That's, that's interesting because I think um, I, I, there's a, a small nonprofit, it, it kind of like as I was in the early days, it's a, it's a board right now that I'm involved with. And a big part of what we're doing is, is cooperating. We're, we do one thing, other overlapping um, organizations. It's kind of like you vend the thing, um, but instead of getting a lot of overlap, you kind of push. You know, you see what where where can we not overlap that we can complement each other, and it's and it's very friendly because I mean people on the outside um, are just looking for help. They're just looking for making sense of the world. Was how, how can you do that? Um, and so you know what opens what OSI advocates and works toward doesn't have to be exactly what what the FSF or the Software Freedom Conservancy or any of these other ones do. Absolutely. And if, if I could build on that a little bit, you know, open source has, um, you know, si Simon, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but from the very beginning, my understanding is that open source uh, was a shared understanding uh, among people who had very different motivations and ideas and philosophies. You know, there was something that everybody agreed on, but, um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, OSI's role all along has been to convene a lot of different types of stakeholders around a shared understanding. Um, and so I think, you know, what you described there, Doc, uh, sort of operates on a few different levels. You know, OSI uh, itself is convening stakeholders with, with different wants and needs, but ultimately who all can get behind the open source definition. Uh, but then, you know, the next layer up, as we collaborate with Software Freedom Conservancy, for instance, um, there's, yes, there's the, the common ground that we have, but you're absolutely right that um, once we've identified that common ground, we can each uh, sort of take ownership of the things that are different um, and and push on those so that we have uh, less duplication of effort, frankly, and, and we need that for uh, in order to, to rise to the challenge that's in front of us. So, so I'm curious about how the collaboration works. I mean, do you have something where, 
you know, um, say Bradley Kuhn at the at the Freedom Conservancy says, uh, we don't we're not taking this one. Can you take it, Josh, uh, or vice versa? Is that the kind of thing that can happen? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, Bradley and, and and Karen at Conservancy are are dear friends. Uh, they, they were they were at my wedding a couple of years ago, uh, and so oh, we wow. have a very uh, you know free flowing line of communication. Um, we will often consult each other about issues of mutual interest. Um, because we run in different circles uh, as well, we often will exchange information to make sure that uh, we have a more complete picture of, of the world we're operating in. Um, you know, I would say, though, that the collaboration is still young. Um, and, and OSI is still going through a very formative stage of, of figuring out the way that it operates. Um, and so right now, while it's sort of like, you know, we'll, we'll trade private messages on, on IRC um, just as needed, you know, the, the hope is that as OSI uh, continues to professionalize and staff up the organization, that there will be some sort of institutional lines of communication uh, that we can, that we can use to work together. But right now it's really, you know, relationship based. Um. Every now and then we, we do have some collaborative activities as well. So uh, we collaborated over um, uh, some amicus briefs to the Supreme Court on a couple of cases. Uh, we in Europe, we've collaborated on uh, their um, public money, public code campaign. Uh, what tends to happen is uh, I get a, uh, a message from uh, Alexander Sander, who's the public policy guy at Free Software Foundation Europe, and he says, we're doing this, this uh, activity. Uh, would you like to, uh, to, to sign on to it or would you like to advertise it or promote it? Or, or I will spot uh, something happening in um, the European Commission's uh, campaigning activities, and I'll tell FSFE, look, I've seen this happening. You know, you maybe you should take some action about it because it looks serious. Uh, there isn't really a formal setup uh, to that, though. That's much more um, uh, based on relationships and on an understanding of what each other's interests and capacities are. And I think that's good, actually. I, you know, I'm I'm looking at formal relationships with standards bodies at the moment, and I would mm -hmm. much rather have friends than memorandums of understanding. It's a fair point. So, so um, we're uh, we're getting toward the end of things here, and we we have a, one of our standard approaches is to have uh, the just three last questions. The first is. Uh, is there anything we should have asked that we haven't asked yet uh, or that you'd like to bring up? Yeah, there's there's one thing that uh, has been a really recurring theme for me over the last couple of years. Um, some, a lot of people um, are surprised to discover that the open source initiative exists, that uh, there is such a thing as the open source definition, Um and you know, open source is so ubiquitous that it means something different to, to everybody. Um, and what I like to, what I want people to know um, is that open source, though the open source definition is about licensing, open source is, the licensing is just a means to an end to the, uh, the open collaboration, the open governance, um, the, the style of community organizing that uh, we, we often describe all of those things as open source. Um, and it's because they are very closely related. Um, and so for, for folks who are curious about, um, about the meaning of open source and, uh, and addressing some of the issues that they feel are facing open source, um, you know, Simon earlier mentioned that OSI has become more democratic over time, and I just really encourage people to uh, to check out OSI, uh, consider participating in our working groups, uh, on our mailing list, and I'll run run for the board um, because it's so important that OSI, you know, OSI was established as a vehicle for the community, 
Um, it now has a board of directors that is largely elected by the community. So it really is a vehicle of buying for the community. And so anybody who thinks who who is OSI to say this is open source and this isn't, well, we are you and you can get involved if you disagree or, or if you agree too. Uh, so I just really encourage people to, uh, to to get involved. That's great. So the, the, the second question is when it could be a joke or it could be uh, really serious. Uh, in my brief experience here, it's worked out both ways. And that is, uh, uh, is there anything about blockchain that's on your radar? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we at RSI have been the beneficiaries twice now of significant grants that have come from people who have lucked out over Bitcoin or blockchain. Uh, we got a, a grant given to us from the Pineapple Fund, uh, if you remember back to that. And we have just recently had a grant given to us by the Handshake Project, uh, who have gave us a, a significant number of, uh, of uh, virtual tokens. And um, w I would very much encourage anyone who's listening or viewing who has got Bitcoin that they don't know what to do with or any other cryptocurrency to send it to us and we will put it to good use and turn it into good outcomes for the open source community. I was just thinking if I bought the Bitcoin at the very beginning when I thought about it and then didn't because <laughs> because I thought it was too complicated, I would be giving you money now, but didn't happen. Uh, so so um, uh, a last question, Josh, is um, what's your favorite uh, text editor and uh, scripting language? Ah, uh, OK, so I'm I'm real basic here. Uh, my favorite text editor. Uh, on, on Terminal is Nano, um, though I tend to use Sublime or Visual Studio Code on, on, uh, on my desktop. And for scripting language, uh, you know, I got my start with, with QBasic and, and VB6 back in the day, uh, but PHP is really where, is really the language that I use for, you know, a couple decades and uh, is, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's part of my bio. You know, I got my start in open source through Drupal and the LAMP stack. So, uh, you know, I got to got to give a shout out to PHP. Are, are you still maintaining something Drupal out there? And is that part still part of your a big part of your life? It's not. I um, it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I ran my last Drupal and the last Drupal install that I maintained uh, was for my personal website. And about two years ago, I finally took that offline in favor of just a, a flat HTML website. Um, but Drupal 9 was just released, and I hear it's pretty slick, so I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> in my Linux journal still is. I mean, it, it still exists as a website, and it's Drupal, and it's staying, it's staying up so far, even though nobody, as far as I know, is maintaining it. Um, but that was a, a big part of our life uh, at Linux Journal for a very long time. In my own case, I've stayed with the flat HTML since 1995, <laughs> so it's just really easy to do if you don't know much. Um, well, it has been it, it has been great uh, great having you here. Um, this is uh, and and Simon on the same case because it's uh, uh, this is a topic that's been dear to my heart and my mind for a very long time. So. That's why I was so eager to get you on as soon as you reached out. Well, thank so, you so much for, for. Sorry, thank you so much for having me. It's it's really a, it's been a life goal, and um, I'm I'm thrilled to be able to have an opportunity to talk about open source initiative. So so so, so Josh, uh, where where can people find you? Uh, at, I I at uh, I know I'm obviously at at OSI, but can you make, get more specific than that? If people seeing this want to say, I got to talk to that guy. Yeah, so uh, you can find me on Freenode IRC. My handle is blue somewhere. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Josh Simmons, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, also Josh Simmons, or just joshsimmons.com, where you will also find my email address. Fantastic. I appreciate that. And uh, I, I want you to join us next week um, uh, when uh, when the show will be with um, uh, a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, known to the world mostly as Identity Woman. Uh, it's Kalia Young. Uh, she co-organizes the Internet Identity Workshop with me. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next week. 
Hi, I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android, where each week I'm joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and a rotating crew of Android journalists, developers, and enthusiasts, where we talk about the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. You can subscribe by going to twit.tv slash AAA or find the show in your podcatcher of choice. That's All About Android. So, so did that go well uh, for you, Simon, and and you know, I think that was. Yeah, I think so. I think so. We're going yeah. to start the new campaign about uh, about uh, Corona licensing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. Yeah. No, I, I thought that went great. Uh, I was able to get across a number of things that I think are, are sort of important messages for us right now. Yeah, something else, by the way, that that threw me off a little was just that. Um, uh, we had a juggle of a future guest and I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, did Kalia swap out and we're going to have somebody else now and I don't have that down. Um, and that, uh, very hard for me to, I'm not a multitasker. Um, and, and that's, I'm kind of a monotasker. I, I can really focus if it's a monotask, but multitasking, not good yeah. at that. Uh, right when, when, when they introduced multi-threading, you never did get upgraded, did you, Doc? <laughs> no, I did not. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> I I was written in machine way too long ago. <laughs> That's the end of it. There's no there's no swapping anything out with this. There's no there's no yeah. firmware upgrade. It just kind of degenerates over time. Uh, I I really like the um, and I, I didn't mention this on, on the show, but I can mention it now. Is that um, uh. My youngest son, who's fresh out of college, um, just went to work for a startup that uh, is started by two guys from Brandeis. Um, nice. So, yeah, I, I don't know if there's an open source side to it or not. He's brand new with it. I don't know much about it. In fact, I don't know it's almost nothing. He's talking mostly to his mom about it because uh, she's really good at giving you giving people career guidance and stuff. But, um, but clearly, you know. Um, Cody people do graduate from Brandeis, and so there's probably that's a and I really like the idea of, t of, of open source making it into the curriculum, into curricula, yeah. and yeah. and it's, and in comp side. That's really a good point. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like yeah. an attempt at that as well. Uh, so we and did. Maybe, we, we had a a guy write a, a full postgraduate curriculum about uh, five years ago, which has gone into a, a college in Canada. And this work mm. at Brandeis is, the, is is really our second attempt at doing it. And this has got mm. much more coherence to it. So this is actually a course you can sign up for. It, you can sign up for it remotely. If you'd like to do one of the modules, you can do do one online right now if you want to and, and get credit towards a, an eventual qualification. So this is much more coherent and it's also much more scalable because it's, it's all um, open courseware. Uh, it's got um, we're, we're we're recording interviews as the basis for the the course content, so th this this I think is a much better attempt than the first attempt, which was great, but um, you know th th yeah. I like this one now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is great. I think it, you can model with that. That that strikes me as a you know a really helpful thing. I mean, on on the wall at. Um, uh, the, remember the, forget the name of it. It was in the social network, even though it wasn't actually there. It's it's a building with two names. It's actually na the maiden names of of uh, Balmer and uh, Gates' mothers, the Dworkin oh. something building, and it's at Harvard, and it's it's the con computer science building, and uh, and it's a scene where you know the guy playing Zuckerberg is running out in the snow in his bathrobe or something, but. Uh, on the wall there is the original code for uh, for basic or something that Bill Gates wrote when he was there. You know, it's on the wall. There's the code it framed on the wall. So not that anybody's going to use that code at this point, but it's a it's a pretty good example of something you look at and debug if you feel like it. So oh, anyway, that would depend on the licensing. <laughs> it would, and, and I think you know, um, and it might be an interesting thought, an interesting thought experiment to go back to that and say what. What would history have been like if this was open sourced? You know, if 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 Microsoft got the clues way back then that they have now, right? Because they spent an yeah. awful long time, for example, giving the world that viral uh, metaphor. You know, that was they were one of the sources of that, I think. 
You know, yeah. that's, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. was that Gates? Gates even said that? He may, it may have. Yeah, I lose track of who it was that came up with that genius thought. But it's it's one of these yeah. typical psychological projection things, you know. You you, yeah. you brand yeah. your opponents with your big with your own biggest problem. And and, and that's what, what I think mm. that uh, viral licensing phrase was really all about. It was uh, yeah. you know, I've tried to unpick proprietary code from Sun and, and it's a hell of a job. You know, you have to invest a lot of legal money, a lot of technical money in in unpicking it all. And I'm sure yeah. that the whoever coined that expression was sitting there on top of a great big pile of proprietary licensed stuff, saying, "Hey, I'm never going to get this undone." I, I you know, because it, it's tentacles right. reach yeah. everywhere, and then you're letting that thought project out into what they saw happening in the free world. Yeah, and there are these sort of in between things that happen, like with Solaris. I mean, I I remember, um, was a it was Sun OS was the predecessor, right? Wasn't it Sun it OS? Was, yes. or, yeah. So I remember sitting in meetings at Sun, Spark International meetings, actually, because I kind of ran that in a way, uh, where they were talking about trying to mush it together with, micro, no, I'm sorry, AT&T's SVR4, System 5 Release 4, mm -hmm. as which is the orthodox Unix of its day, right, and m moving those two together, but not even as open source. Open source wasn't even on the map yet, exactly. But later they went through that with Solaris. Uh, which I guess is still used somewhere, is it? I, I don't even know. Yeah, is, is so that... Oracle are still using Solaris as the operating system for their appliances. They they have a lot yeah. of Spark-based hardware that they sell, and they're using Solaris yeah. as the operating system for that. Um, uh, but they, it's also still got a life, you know, it, it, going open source, it became a thing called Illumos, and Illumos still has a life as well out there. There is still an Illumos community. I was reading today how OpenPCB has just been ported to Illumos so people can use it on uh, their Illumos systems. So uh, once you've made something open source, you can never unopen source it, even if you're Oracle. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> There, there, old code does continue to live forever. Some of it, you know, I mean, it, it, we still have fax machines. We still have yeah. COBOL. We still have dot matrix printers. You know, there, you still need to be able to do things that only those things do.